Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this session on stimulating innovation and growth. Um, I guess as a preliminary, before we get to the substance of the panel, I'd, I'd make the usual comment that I know chairs have been making all day yesterday and this morning, which is um, the reason these panels are staggered is so that people can go from one to the other. Uh, panelists do not take it personally. Uh, they themselves don't indulge in that uh, while on a panel. Uh, but please try and be as uh, unobtrusive as you can be uh, going in and coming out of, of any panel. Uh, when INET was created, what, five, five-ish years ago, uh, and two of the co-founders are with us on the panel this morning, uh, innovation was surely central to the thinking, although the preoccupation was with the then financial and still financial and increasingly political crisis. The fact is that as you think about what INET was about and, and the changing nature of the economics discipline, uh, the nature of innovation, its causes, its consequences, and its management and encouragement uh, stand, stand central to, to where the discipline is headed. And we've come a long way, obviously, from seeing technological change as a residual in an equation. On the other hand, as you all would know better than anyone, uh, there is so much more we, we need to explore, especially as the nature of the economy changes and perhaps dematerializes. Uh, we have three uh, excellent panelists to help us uh, stimulate the, uh, the discussion, uh, and then a, dis uh, a discussant, and we should have at least half an hour for uh, a discussion with, with all of you. Uh, the ground rules are always the same, uh, no more than 15 minutes per panelist, uh, and then a, a wrap-up by the discussant. We will go in the or order that the uh, speakers are listed. Jim Balsillie is one of the co-founders of INET. He's also the founder of the organization that I head, uh, CG. And so this is one of those rare times when I get to say to my boss, your time's up, but I will if I have to. Um, he will be followed, and, and he needs no introduction. Actually, none of our panelists do, and I won't go into detail, except to remind you that uh, part of creating uh, a high-tech Fortune 500 company involves nothing but innovation. And so Jim is very well placed to talk about both the practitioner and the policy side uh, of, of, and, and the wealth creation side of all of this. He will be followed by Dan Bresnitz, now at the University of Toronto. Welcome to Canada, Dan, uh, uh, who has done a lot of scholarly work on how uh, innovation systems compare across countries and, and what works where and why. And he will be followed by Andy Wyckoff, who is one of our hosts, and, and thank you for having us here. And he heads the OECD's work in, in, this, broad, uh, in this broad stream. And they will be followed by the, the, uh, the other co-founder of, of INET, Bill Janeway, a scholar practitioner funder of innovation and, and, and who will bridge the, the various uh, streams that the three uh, initial speakers will, will present. Uh, Jim, over to you. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Rohinton, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor to be back at INET among so many friends, and I had the honor of helping host this event in Canada last year. And given the magnitude of the challenge Robert Johnson and his team selected for this year's theme, uh, Paris and the OECD specifically is the perfect venue for us to con convene as this organization is the epicenter of critical discussions on the economic and social well-being of every human on earth. Now, Bill Janeway wanted us to have a maximum number of slides for each uh, presenter, um, and because um, uh, both Andy and Dan are a little over their maximum. I decided to have none, and we instituted a cap-and-trade program, <laughs> and, uh, and, and I collected uh, return for trading off my slide quota, so um, I'm fetting myself for this. Um, the subject we are approaching today, the interplay between innovation and growth, is something that I've wrestled with uh, regularly for decades. I started my career trying to tackle this subject at the firm level as co-founder and co-CEO of Research in Motion, now BlackBerry. What I learned growing the company from infancy to $20 billion in global sales is that the microeconomic outcomes are in fact largely the result of macroeconomic systems. 
And, th and that is not to say a good idea is not valuable. I've met with innovators and entrepreneurs from all corners of the globe, and their ideas are brilliant. There are no cultural, religious, gender, ethnic, or geographic determinants to having a good idea. Yes, there is a global imbalance in education and a quality of opportunity that will impact the commercialization of ideas. But that alone does not explain why an idea incubated in one country will deliver significantly different economic results as in another. Let me be clear. Where an idea is conceived today is a key determinant on whether it has the opportunity to scale to a globally competitive company, employ hundreds if not thousands of well-paid employees, and provide significant revenues for home governments. Geopolitics is at the heart of ideas commercialization. Not, o not only because the money is enormous, but also because the possession of ideas and the ensuing profits are manipulated at the state level. When a company from a Western liberal democracy produces a good within the resource, agriculture, or traditional manufacturing sectors, these are of a known market value, and the ownership of these goods is determined in domestic courts. No foreign interest can arbitrarily claim ownership of tangible goods in stable Western-style democracies. But an idea's value is intangible. Its ownership is almost always determined in the United States because that is the big market for technological goods. The ensuing settlements that U.S. court decisions require usually must be effective globally for the settling parties. As a result, the domestically accountable U.S. court system is effectively the world's reserve intellectual property court system. My experience in building one of the most valuable technology patent portfolios in the world was eye-popping. At peak, I was dealing with 400 active IPR legal files after having settled one of the largest patent troll case, after the largest patent troll case in history, in a U.S. court. Our company at the time employed 150 IPR legal experts, mostly based in Dallas, Texas. In 2011 alone, I had personally approved over six billion U.S. in IPR royalty payments. If you're not convinced of the economic nationalism behind fir firm level IPR litigation, let me provide you with an example. The high profile legal battle between Apple and Samsung. The two companies are still at war with each other over annual royalty payments over patent licenses which amount to billions of dollars annually of pure profit to the victor. Apple recently gained the upper hand with certain district court rulings in Northern California where it coincidentally keeps its headquarters. In June 2013, Samsung scored a major victory over Apple in, in an independent decision by the U.S. International Trade Commission, an independent institution, to ban the import of Apple products into the United States because of infringement of, pat of Samsung patents. In August 2013, two months later, President Obama vetoed the IDC's decision. This was the first time in over 26 years such a veto was exercised. Later. Later that year, President Obama de declined to veto a ban of Samsung products, in ensuring that Apple maintained its profitable leverage over Samsung. The global money at stake is enormous, so states and corporations work together to win. When Tim Cook is invited to sit beside Michelle Obama during the President's State of Union address, just before these White House decisions were made, it's not because Democrats are courting big business. It's because in the United States, intellectual property is big business. Ironically, when the punditry regularly suggests that the US political system is broken, when it comes to maximizing the wealth created from ideas, I'd argue the system is working like a well-oiled machine. High margin intellectual property rights accounts for half of the US exports, contributes $3.5 trillion of pure margin to the US economy annually, and directly employ nearly 18 million workers in high paying jobs. That's prosperity from ideas commercialization. The 1998 Copyright Term Extension Act, der derisively called the Mickey Mouse Protection Act, extended corporate copyright protection further to 95 years starting in 2019, even if the creative works have been published decades before. This, along with the American Vents Acts, are just two examples of a legislative strategy that creates rapidly evolving rules designed to advance only U.S. economic interests. 
America's efforts to dominate in the commercialization of ideas has found its way into the country's diplomatic efforts. Signific su successive administrations have been focused on this driver of prosperity. As a major creator and distributor of creative content, the U.S. has a great deal to gain by lobbying for new rules to make it illegal to enjoy their creative outputs without new licenses. When the U.S. wants to protect its valuable competitive advantage in this realm, it does not wait for the WTO to enforce TRIPS. One of the underreported stories derived from the WikiLeaks was the level of pressure American diplomats place on governments around the world to enact copyright legislation in line with the Mickey Mouse Protection Act. They act bilaterally on matters that contribute to America's bottom line, and they do so using all the levers of the public sector, including the district court system, the DOJ, the USTR, and yet any other agency that can contribute. The US is not alone in winning the, war, the commercialization war. Europe is equally sophisticated in, in its IPR prosperity strategy. I experienced this firsthand in Brussels as a member of the European Union's Digital Advisory Committee, working with the European Union Competition Bureau on two separate IPR files, and while lobbying for rules that would govern the new pan-European unified patent court. Europe's IPR strategy is also focused on bilateral engagement to push their trade partners to align their laws to Europe's in areas such as high-value drug patents. While Europe has its own processes and systems like the US, its broader public institutions like Germany's Mannheim Regional Rocket Docket, the Competition Bureau, and the European Patent Office are all focused towards the same end, commercialization of indigenous innovations. I don't blame Europeans or Americans for their shrewd approaches to this matter. Maintaining their prosperity and standard of living are dependent on creating wealth from ideas. Advanced countries use whatever power they have, including the highest offices in the country, to win. The stakes couldn't be higher for them. PricewaterhouseCooper and Bloomberg's listing of the top 100 companies in the world by market capitalization shows two important trends. One, the US and Europe house the world's most valuable companies. And two, technology companies are the fastest risers since 2009. Coincidentally, the top 10 technology companies on that list are all American and European. The fact is that high margin profits stemming from ideas commercialization are critical for a country's prosperity and countries that owe their prosperity to innovation rely on strategic engagement between their entrepreneurs and their policymakers. Now I can see my American and European friends in the audience breathing easy. And what about the rest of us? Well, let me start by saying I maintain hope at the micro level. As I mentioned earlier, the curiosity and drive possessed by the innovators and entrepreneurs I've met around the world is inspiring. I'm confident that the world's cream of the crop will succeed regardless of where they are born. However, in this globalized world, with their desire to succeed under the current state of the innovation economy I've described, these entrepreneurs will be driven to re relocate to Silicon Valley, Germany, or France, or wherever they have the best chance to scale their idea to a globally competitive business. This will become a serious development and economic challenge for emerging innovation economies. It will also come with social repercussions as we have seen migration of some of the most promising entrepreneurs in countries struggling to create wealth from an ideas economy. Policymakers in these countries must take every step to provide them a relatively level playing field and appeal to their nationalistic pride. They must develop legal and intellectual property regimes that enable their technology industries to grow before their companies are acquired, sued into bankruptcy, or tactically tied up in court proceedings until they are bled dry. They must become shrewder in their bilateral negotiations with established innovation nations and push for greater clarity in global institutions charged with managing issues of intellectual property. If they allow the current status quo to be maintained, the chasm between the have and the have not in the highly competitive global innovation game will only grow and calcify. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, thank you for um, having me here. Um, it's also, um, as, as somebody who was born in Israel and then spent time in Italy, 
having to sit down and not use my hands when I'm talking is basically causing me to be half silenced, but I'll try. Um, I'm going to talk about something slightly different, and that's distributive, what I call distribution sensitive science technology and innovation policies. Um, and my discussion points, and I, I want to explain how I got there. So most of my research until about two or three years ago was all about how public policies in both emerging and already wealthy countries can increase innovation-based growth, which I think is the only sustained engine of growth. However, doing that, and especially looking at the place I was born, Israel, I started to become worried that what happens with this growth is that we also might influence inequality. And when we influence inequality and create more inequality, whether or not it's because of innovation, um, we might suffer uh, from a system that will then react in a way that decrease our innovation, meaning decrease our growth, meaning everybody lose. And what I would argue here is that um, part of what we have been doing up until now, which is basically doing redistribution, saying, okay, let's play the game. People will lose and then we'll tax them because that's what we do and give the money back is not, we've reached that limit. So what we need to start to do now is actually think about our growth creation policies as a tool to address economic inequality and figure out whether we can even use it. And this is why I started to talk about distribution sensitive uh, science, technology, innovation policies, as I think we need to change our thinking from what we will call welfare state to a welfare regime, meaning how we as a society can truly think about a quality of opportunity, not a quality of outcomes. And what can we do in order to ensure that we have a quality of opportunity, um, even if we have highly unequal um, outcomes? So innovation and inequality. What we do know, we don't know a lot about innovation policy and inequality, but we start to have a lot of research. We talk about innovation and inequality, which I have to say, uh, while I think it's important, I don't think innovation leads by definition to inequality. Uh, it's the way that we have constructed policies. So we have four things. I'll talk about three, but mention the third. The first is skill-based technological change. The whole argument is that we do innovation, it helps the high-skilled, which are already well off, we're getting even richer, the rest of us are not. I just have to say, if any one of you have not read Darun's uh, paper, this is a trend from the 1900, and it's actually a trend because we have become really good at educating people, so entrepreneurs take advantage of resources. This is not a natural law of technology. Second is the changing workplace, uh, the race against a machine, is the most famous book in this. And basically saying that a lot of people lose their job when you have new innovations. Again, people sort of are all hooked up on novel innovation. In reality, what makes this happen is the innovation we don't talk about, which is incremental and constant. In order to double the capacity of hardware every 18 months, and we are even better and increasing uh, algorithms, we have to constantly innovate in the background. This allows many other things, but if we don't realize that, and that that would allow us all those novel innovation, we will be in bad place. And the last but not least is something that I've done a lot of research on, and that's a global fragmentation of production. And that allows us a lot of ICT and transportation. Increased number of jobs we, people like to think about them being transferred. In reality, they're not transferred now. They're not created in the first place. If Jim and I will now create a new company in Toronto or Waterloo, we will probably not do the manufacturing in Canada. All that manufacturing will happen somewhere else. It also, however, means that if you don't realize it, 
and you public policy invest a lot in innovation, and then you're surprised that new jobs for unskilled are not happening in your country, you probably haven't looked at the world for the last 20 years. We also, however, have to remember that this decrease inequality between countries because it allows other countries to actually create a lot of jobs, and those are usually poor countries. We cannot understand what happened in China without understanding this transformation. I'm not going to talk a lot about financialization, but I think part of what Jim talked about is exactly this. How do we incentivize innovators and entrepreneurs, and how do we finance them, and also how do we then give them back money what kind of game do we have here? And whether it is indeed a winners take all, and who are the winners, and whether the playing field are tilted. So that's my problem. My problem is if we don't do anything about it, we'll end up with a hawk, which A, is a brute force approach. As Piketty said, it might be a very good approach because if you break a lot of capital equipment in a big war, you have at least 40 years of uh, equal growth. But it might be slightly wasted. What is also important for those of you who might not be into an uh, American comic uh, culture, the hawk is also in his alter ego the world best physicist, the second best brain in the whole world. And, but when he becomes angry and frustrated, that's basically what happens. Supposedly a force for good, but destroying the system in his, which he works in. And I think that if we don't think about it, the political reality will demand the hawk. So, distribution sensitive science and technology and innovation policies. Uh, my first, the first thing I ever did, uh, unfortunately for my friends, was to start a software company. Quickly, we discovered that I don't know how to write code. So <laughs> I, I become the manager by default. And then I realized that when you're the manager, actually those rules about design, meaning that if you don't design the software very well, the cost of actually fixing it in the end are more than you can afford. And I think that's what's happening now also with taxation. So I think we should now think about growth and also how we create or might do growth that create or help inequality if we can, or at least not increase inequality. And I would like to suggest that we can start to think about it in the case of innovation. Basically, the analytical focus that I've done in this paper, which is a very early paper, is what is the effect of innovation policy, not innovation, on specific disadvantaged groups, either as producers or as consumers of technology. And if you go back to all the things that I said about innovation and inequality, they all treat human beings even as, either as producers or users of innovation. And this is what I want to have. I want the Batman approach. And again, for people who don't know, the Batman is the only superhero without any superhero powers. The only thing he has is his cave, where he devises new technologies and gadgets, and then go to fight crime. He has zero superpower. It's all about innovation. <laughs> <laughs> so, I will uh, use moving to reality from the Batman. Uh, I basically suggest four ideal types, there might be more, of how we can think about innovation policy that would at least not increase inequality. First is innovation policy for traditional industries. Partly is that if, especially, again, I'm talking about the already wealthy, if you increase productivity in traditional industries where we still employ, if you look at the statistic, a lot of people with relatively, let's call, mid-skill, not necessarily high skills, in a way which is not just skill-based technical change, we will probably create or maintain a large number of jobs for people that we should, at least 50% of our population. Second is geographical economic periphery. I don't need to talk about it, I think, in the EU. 
But the idea is, again, can you, with innovation policy, actually increase clusters or growth in regions that are in the periphery? Open questions, but at least we should talk about it. Ascriptive minorities is uh, the word for minorities you're born into. So women and ethnic minorities, and whether they are even, and in some cases I will, I will show you that there's a bias against them in the high-tech industry, whether we can do something about it. And out of all the consumers of technology, I picked the disabled because uh, it's a large and growing share of the adult population, again, especially in the already wealthy world, between 10 to 20%. So anything that allows them to be productive, I think it's important. Um, there's no data, sadly, uh, because nobody talks about it. So we used exploratory case study approach, looking at Israel, US, Sweden, and Germany. I'm now starting to look at Canada, period analyzed around uh, since 2000. And it's important to remember with all those policies. So what we did is look at the ideal types and look at policies that might do something of the ideal types and what are the impacts and how they're run. It's important to note that none of those innovation policies are actually seems and were created in order to do anything about inequality. So there's no data about how they're doing with that. And therefore, it's very hard to evaluate on that, OK? So what I suggest here is nothing to do with evaluation of whether we're doing the um, um, distribution sensitive anything, because this is not what, why they were created. Uh, I picked Israel because it's the ideal, and in the wrong sense of ideal, it's the one country that, according to the OECD, at the same time as it becomes the startup nation, also moved to from the second most agglutinarian society to the second most unequal society in the OECD. The latest figures I've seen from this organization claim that one out of five householders in Israel are now in poverty. At the same years that it had its biggest economic miracle based on innovation. Um, the first thing that the Israeli government mostly from the Office of Chief Scientists, did is traditional industries. And they specifically did it because of those figures, but not because of inequality. What they found out, the total factor productivity, or productivity, whatever you want to call it, is growing up only in the ICT and to some degree the biotech sectors, and actually stagnant and, or growing down in all the rest of the private sector. That's Manuel Trachtenberg's work. This then translate to policies that said, well, if we're so good in R&D, why not move this R&D and policies into other sectors? So it's more a macroeconomic policy, not about inequality. Um, novel product focus in traditional industries started in 2005. Very quick uh, um, realization that there is a need to deal with demand. Because unlike high-tech people that know what R&D is about, if you go to metal bashers that uh, have done metal bashing for you know, 100 years owned by the same family, you have to explain the whole idea of routinizing R&D. Um, and you have to then give them consultant to how to write a proposal based on IPR. A and they've done it. It's growing very rapidly seems as a success in what it's supposed to do. But what is even more interesting is it now seems to have economic success with a great side benefits, inequality. So both a prime minister and the minister of economic development all talk about it now in terms of that helps inequality in Israel. And by the way, it also helped growth. s and in the periphery, very similar to what we found in the EU and the US. It's basically all the industrial policy tradition goal that was injected into innovation policy, mainly on in capital investment and relocation of activities. FDI, if you think about Ireland or the South in the US, um, and technological incubators. Um, had some success, but I'm not sure it's great. I'm also not sure it's great in every other place I've looked at it, to be honest. Um, Israeli Arabs. Fact, 
that there are a significant disadvantage and low participation in the high-tech sectors. They have 1.3% of the jobs, while they're 20% of the population, 30% lower salaries on average. They're actually very highly educated population. Uh, there's also, for our point of research, there's mistrust, large mistrust between the state and the Arabs. Um, when this was started, again, around 2000, 2005, this was seen as an economic imperative. We have 20% of a population that is not participating and are poor. This has nothing to do with inequality. We, if we want to improve our growth rates, we have to engage them. Labor market participation, including STEM education, huge amount of work, interestingly, all privatized, partly because of this mistrust. It's run by NGOs. The money comes from the state. Extremely successful in my account. Not necessarily for inequality, but for growth. There's tenfold increase just in labor participation in less than three years. There is also high-tech entrepreneurship, and I know that our former premier talked about it with the First Nations. Unfortunately, just like in Canada, a lot of talk, not a lot of anything that has been done. Um, more of a prey of a song, but again, I think that this is evolutionary policy. Only once you create the workforce and the knowledge of how to even work in this industry, you can hope to have successful entrepreneurs. And lastly is the disabled. It's the only program whose motivation is specifically social, not inequality, but sort of do good, let them be part of a society. Um, basically a program like all the chief scientists, we will give you up to 85% of R&D cost if you will do products that allow disabled people to have normal daily life. Um, capped at the low budget, extremely low demand. Uh, surprise, surprise, when there's no market or no proof of market, entrepreneurs don't come and, and want to work in that. Very strange, or not. Uh, maybe we should work on the other part and show that you can make a profit there. Um, so, in conclusion, I argue that both in theory, but also in the example I've shown, and we can talk also about other countries, this show promise. So maybe we should call the child by its name and actually think about inclusion and distribution sensitive policies when we talk about innovation policies because then we can actually have experimentation. And then we can actually have data collection that allow us all to evaluate whether our experiment works. Without that, I don't know what we can do. Second, I think that we have to think and devise effective, uh, when we, if that's what we want to do, and include distribution concern and effective, and I have to say again, we have to have effective innovation policies because we have to have growth. We have to start understanding what do we know about distributional outcomes of different innovation policy. The answer here is we don't, so we might as well start to do research. And what do we know of a distributional outcome of different kind of innovational activities because we know the world is fragmented and not every country in the world is doing every stages of production. So how do we then think about how our investment in, let's say, pure R&D translate to economic growth in Canada? And we, again, don't do that. So I'll stop here in the OECD and I in it and says that if there is one important part of future research, we should put a lot of resources into it's that one, and I don't see almost any researchers <coughs> doing any work here. So I would make a joke about the cap and trade that Jim introduced, but Bill Janeway scared the hell out of me yesterday. And so <laughs> I'm not going to waste any time. I'm going to go straight into my um, PowerPoint. I'm from the OECD. Welcome. Uh, it's great to have you here. Uh, what I'm going to show you today is a, really a proposal. It's a work in progress. It's not a presentation. We don't have a paper. And consequently, 
uh, you need to listen to this, does not represent the work of the OECD committees or our council. Uh, I'm speaking on my personal capacity. That, that is important, but it benefits directly and greatly from work done by two colleagues, Carolyn Ponoff, who's here, and Dominique Gallec. So let me go back to where we started with Mr. Schumpeter. Uh, this is the second phase of our work. I'm going to skip over the first phase. Second phase, we're going to look at the top of the pyramid. We're going to look at OECD countries and the interplay of innovation and inequality. Um, and that will be the focus of my remarks today. And it's important to remember what Schumpeter said, that innovation naturally leads to monopoly profits with scale, and which limits competition and hence generates wealth. He argued this would soon be competed away by rivals and imitators coming in with lower prices leading to the creative destruction. I won't dwell on this, but it's worth looking back, I think, at the 20th uh, century, just a minute or two. And I've picked on all Americans here because a lot of the inequality debate is actually focused on the United States. And it's interesting to look back in Vanderbilt, Rockefeller, Carnegie, Ford, George Eastman, and Bill Gates, nearly all of whom were characterized as robber barons in their day, uh, and some of them were the wealthiest men of their era, if not today, when we adjust for real prices. This was a world of tangibles, where as you scaled railroads, cars, photography, marginal cost was very important. It was scale with mass. Massive factories and operations, concentration of material, think of River Rouge, resources and labor. And this concentration made it possible then to have organized labor. We saw the provision of benefits we'd never seen before, things like weekends and vacations, to retirement and health care, and even housing and cultural amenities in some cases. We also witnessed the rise of the median level of income, and labor share rose over time relative to capitals in overall income distribution. I'm going to go over this quickly because I am time constrained. As has been well documented at this conference once again, the current situation is characterized by growing inequality in almost every country, particularly the 1%. Uh, not surprisingly, innovation is a factor. And I want to refer to a very recent paper by Philippe Aguignon and colleagues who find a causal relationship between innovativeness as measured by patenting and increasing share of income by the top 1%. And actually, I was trying to compress slides here, so I, this is the top 1%, the genie going up in many countries. Now, it's really this that I want to focus on, the, the declining share of labor uh, in all of income, uh, which we see across many countries over time. And we know that the share held by capital, the wealth thrown off by capital, uh, disproportionately accrues to the top 10, and particularly the 1%. And that has been echoed many times at this conference, so I won't go over it again. Um, we have a lot of analysis that has looked at the labor share of, of the equation. Danny just referred to a little bit, skilled bias change, CEO salaries, impact of globalization, and the growth, maybe not as much research here, the growth of what's called a freelance or on-demand uh, economy, things like Uber. A main focus of our work at the OECD and where I would like your comments today is going forward will be to explore the changing nature of capital and why it is growing at the expense of labor. And my working hypothesis actually is based on this book we put out in 2013, which you can get at your favorite library or even ours, it makes for great summer reading. Um, and that is looking at uh, uh, knowledge-based capital. I'm going to explain what we mean by that in, in a minute because, uh, again, we know the returns to capital go to the top. This knowledge-based capital work builds on work coming out of the Federal Reserve System, particularly work by Nakamura at the Philadelphia Fed, Fed but particularly work by Carol Corrado, Chuck Holton, and Dan Sickle in 2005 on the Federal Reserve Board. And they came up with this classification that we have rephrased from the word intangibles to knowledge-based capital, which includes things like computerized information, software and databases, innovative property like R&D, patents that Jim has talked about and designs, and economic competencies that tend to be a little bit more tacit, but not always, branding, 
networks, and organizational know-how. In short, knowledge-based capital, or what I will call KBC, is investment in innovation. And almost all KBC is owned and controlled by firms as a capital asset, even though it doesn't necessarily show up on their balance sheet. And here, accounting standards are trying to update, but it's not making very good progress. And what I want to postulate is that, as the name suggests, knowledge-based capital is about human creation that has been legally codified like a patent or systematized and controlled by the firm like R&D. And so it's things that we carry around in our heads, creativity, expert decision-making, know-how. And 50 years ago, when my father walked out of his, uh, his working establishment every night, he carried with him this know-how. As a laborer, he was compensated for these attributes through wages, and it showed up in the labor side of the income ledger. Now, increasingly, a lot of these are codified in expert system software, in intellectual property, and even now the big data phenomena, mining of data to actually get to uh, enhance marketing and uh, opinions. Um, and these are bought and sold like assets. And Jim can certainly tell you a lot about, about that. And, earn, and firms earn returns to this capital, and they've grown over time. A slide that I cut, but we've seen a big increase in royalties on patents over time. And when you look at these two, just the combination of knowledge-based capital with physical capital, you see over time in the United States, KBC now exceeds that of physical capital. And many of us learned in graduate school that capital was equipment, structures, and machinery. But we're building on that and saying, no, it should be much more than that, particularly in the 21st um, century. And it's not just the US. Across many countries, we see the same phenomena going on. And when we added up, and this was work that we did as a consortia with other organizations here at the OEC, it reveals that the top of that bar, not the bottom base, but the top lighter blue colors, KBC matches or exceeds investments in tangible equipment now. And this is common in countries like Sweden and Finland and the United States and the UK. And increasingly, the value of many leading cutting edge firms, and whole industries for that matter, is in their knowledge-based capital. For example, 95% of Google's value is in such intangible assets such as their algorithm and their patents. And you'll never see that algorithm value or the data that they mine in their annual report as an asset, but it certainly is what gives that firm a competitive advantage. Increasingly, even blue-collar industries like the automotive sector are becoming more knowledge-intensive. GM's electric hybrid car, the Chevy Volt, contains 10 million lines of software code. And about 40% of new car development, particularly at the high end, is either software or electronics. Now, this is going to be hard to read, and so I'll just give you the bottom line. This is a growth accounting exercise done by Carroll and some colleagues between 1995 and 2007. The bottom line are the red boxes here, which look uh, thank you, which look at capital's contribution. And you can see uh, more than half of, I'm sorry, more than half, I put on my glasses. But uh, we break down tangible capital into KBC capital, she does rather, with her colleagues, and shows that in case of the United States, more is coming from KBC now than from tangible. And Europe, it's a little bit less, but combined, capital plays this huge role in growth now, with labor playing a less growing role, mainly because we have exhausted, to some extent, uh, improvements in human capital through added skills over time. Now, KBC has some very unique properties, and Jim began to go over this, and I won't dwell on it, but just briefly, there's non-rivalry, only partial excludability, very high fixed cost. That first version of that program is expensive. The marginal cost, additional copies, are reasonably cheap. And this kind of underpins the rationale for intellectual property rights. Otherwise, copying would undermine the incentive to innovate in this area. In the United Kingdom, Jonathan Haskell found that 
of the United Kingdom's knowledge-based capital was actually protected by intellectual property rights, things like patents, copyright, and trademark, which basically allow exclusive rights. Now, going back to Schumpeter's argument about innovation itself leading to monopolies, well, here we've added to that, uh, because in this case, monopoly is actually being extended or granted as a matter of policy as well. In addition, and I need to go quickly here, but KBC is beginning to become digitized. Uh, not only the software and data, which was that computerized part of it, but things like patents and copyright design, marketing know-how can be digitized and moved very quickly across the globe to wherever you need them. And I'll get to that in a second because it links to our work on base erosion and profit shifting. I just want to give you an example quickly. This is what Eric Vignolson would call increasingly scale without mass. You have Google at basically 50 billion in sales, but 1 million per employee, the US average, much lower. Amazon, not as high, but again, 600K per employee, three times what Walmart is, and Walmart is a very efficient retailer. Um, the digital economy gives us examples of massive network externalities, where winner takes most, at least, raising issues for competition, and with it, income inequality. And it's beginning to lead, going back to the capital labor interchange here, to a deconcentration of jobs. If I just show you the top three automakers in 1990s had about one point, this is US, had 1.2 million employees. If you look at the top three tech in the US, they have one-tenth the number of employees, but about the same revenues in a much larger market cap. And so what we're beginning to see is this deconcentration of jobs compared to the 19th century. And it raises concerns such as those articulated by Larry Summers last month that we may indeed be in a way of structural change where capital is substituting for labor and hence the shift from L to K in our equation. I want to complicate this further with some new data that uh, is just coming out from the OECD soon. This is collaborative work by my part of the OECD as well as the Economics Department, which looks at productivity growth recently. There's a phantom machine. And what it uses firm level data to break down the average, which is the dark line here. And you begin to see this bifurcation over time where you've got these global frontier terms, the dashed line, growing much faster and beginning to pull away. It's the wedge here. Uh, and this is even true for services where we don't typically see big productivity gains. Um, I want to then go to, um, as this phenomenon unfolds, we're beginning to see a change in the way the capital is used. One change in use is, um, in capital is buying back shares. I'm not going to go into that, but you see capital increasingly being used to raise the share price of firms through cash, through buybacks. Another is just simply holding on to the cash. And we've seen a large, it's up to 1.62 trillion in 2011, basically unchanged in 2013. And what's interesting about this is that a big chunk of this cash is held by tech firms, which is a proxy for innovation, about 40%. And of that, five are held by very innovative firms, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Verizon, and Pfizer. And if Apple isn't seeing demand for its products, no company is. And there's a question, why are they sitting on so much cash when there's obviously demand for what they're doing out, out, out there? Well, there's two reasons. One, Apple came close to bankruptcy. They're a bit risk averse. They remember that day. And fortunes can quickly reverse in this field. The other is, tax avoidance strategies. It's called BEPS, Base Rows and Profit Shifting, that book profits in low tax countries, typically outside the borders. And given the way the tax regime is in the United States, they don't want to repatriate them because they're going to pay a large tax. 76% of Apple's cash is offshore, 94% from Microsoft. And I should say that half of the income shifting through BEPS is based on uh, R&D-based intangibles. And so it comes back to Jim's point, I think. There, there's this big interplay at the global level with intellectual property. I am now over time. I want to say another way that they're using our, their, their money is through lobbying. 
And this just shows the recent lobbying efforts on net neutrality in the United States where disproportionately the incumbents were outspending the so-called entrants like Google. I want to end by just saying that Schumpeter would have said, yeah, but we'll have this churn, we'll have new entrants coming in, and they will erode these monopoly profits, and we're not seeing this. Uh, this shows entrepreneurship, sorry, declining across the OECD over time. The number of new starts are down, and it's, that's unfortunate because it's these companies that give you disproportionate job growth. Let me really end by skipping that and talking about four different policy areas that I think we need to think about to get to where Danny was talking about, of infusing innovation policies with another bottom line, which is that of thinking about uh, a more equitable distribution of the re returns. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bill. Yeah. Good. Very good. <clears throat> I am going to find Do some I links. I uh, sorry. I'm going to find some links uh, between the three excellent presentations. Um, and I want to begin, uh, I will go and comments on each of them in order. Um, Jim's report from the trenches uh, suggests a possibility of thinking about a, a, a relatively um, short-sighted self-interest in the national system of innovation represented by the uh, corporate state collaboration around IP in the United States. And I say that because the, the golden age usually referred to with respect to high growth with low inequality of the 1950s and 60s and 70s was also a golden age for innovation in the United States. It was a golden age uh, for innovation most directly sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense, uh, which radically accelerated the development of all of the technologies from silicon to software that combined and integrated, produced digitalization, the digital economy, however we want to characterize it, the world we're now living in. And that sponsorship came with the requirement of an extraordinarily open intellectual property regime. The Defense Department was the primary funder of research, uh, sometimes in collaboration with the three-letter agencies, sometimes channeled through the National Science Foundation, uh, but in all cases requiring recipients of that research funding to license any patents uh, on the original um, uh, fair, non-discriminatory basis which required that they license to their direct competitors. And when, uh, as, a, as a customer, as the early collaborative creative customer, of the technologies that were not yet ready for commercialization, uh, including particularly microelectronic devices, um, if you sold something that mattered to the Defense Department, you actually had to put a second source into production as a direct competitor to whom the Defense Department could turn if you failed. Um, the, uh, the second uh, the second uh, short-sighted aspect, leaping forward 50 years, comes with the extent to which the accumulated citadels of, of intellectual property protected by law have not in fact been protected from what has come to be called infomercantilism, uh, particularly associated with the extraordinary success of China in taking what had been the ad hoc entrepreneurial activities of all uh, economies playing catch up behind the frontier leaders in technology, that is, beginning their process of catching up by appropriating intellectual property that already existed. Uh, this goes back to uh, the British uh, appropriating Italian silk manufacturing technology in the 16th century. Uh, of course, the U.S. Uh, doing the same to Britain with respect to cotton textiles in the late 18th and early 19th century and on through uh, Japan and Korea. In China, it's become the most extraordinarily effective 
uh, national program, um, which, among other uh, uh, roadside uh, victims, uh, Northern Telecom, once a leading uh, technology company whose IP became uh, contributed largely to Huawei's enormous uh, success in the global telecommunications uh, market. So, the uh, I, I would suggest that on the one hand, the um, uh, narrow focus on maximizing current profits from intellectual property in the U.S., I'm less uh, knowledgeable about Europe, on the one hand neglects the history that showed how an open IP regime uh, was accompanied by extraordinarily accelerated, distributed, open uh, innovation, but also is no protection uh, longer term on a strategic basis. Um, so let me then go to, um, to, to Danny's um, uh, points um, and to begin by uh, suggesting that more or less in parallel with this discussion in um, conference room uh, six, there was Alberto Bata was uh, presenting on inequality, innovation, and public investment and pointing out uh, some very, very useful um, uh, basic um, uh, critiques, if you like, of a kind of, of, the, of the attempt to derive a simplistic uh, linear relationship between innovation and inequality, where to begin with, the direction of causality is certainly subject to debate, uh, and in some cases, extremely contentious debate. Does innovation cause uh, inequality, or does inequality uh, responsible for innovation? I had a um, brilliant classmate at Princeton 50 years ago named Ed Tenor. If you haven't ever come across his book, Technology Bites Back, I urge it upon you. As an, as an undergraduate, Ed formulated um, a, 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 a schema for thinking about how to get educated at Princeton in the 1960s. Princeton had an institution known as the Precept, which was not quite an Oxford-Cambridge tutorial, but was a small group, small discussion group. And the way to succeed in a precept, Ed proposed, was by mastering the theory of the sept. The sept is the smallest atom atomic unit of human knowledge. And you would deploy these in the precept discussion and score points uh, repeatedly and triumph. And he, he elevated this from the, the sept. Remember, this is the heart of the Cold War. We're there at Princeton with the bombers and the uh, transport planes flying down to Florida and the Cuban Missile Crisis. So the sept could be escalated into a kilosept or potentially a megasept. And the, the, the ultimate way to triumph was by deploying a reversible megasept. Capitalism causes Protestantism. No, wait a second, Calvinism. No, Calvinism causes capitalism. Well, I think a little bit about inequality and innovation as the ultimate reversible megasept, where in fact, and this is what Alberto Bato was discussing in the other conference room, there are so many common factors. There are so many confusing institutional cultural, political factors that intermediate between observable rates of innovation and observable conditions of inequality, that this remains, as, as, as Danny says, a, a, a domain which calls for much richer, uh, much richer exploration, in part by telling stories, not only by attempting to run um, uh, econometric regressions, uh, which one might say are, are premature. And, and perhaps the most important intermediating is precisely the role of the state. I spoke about the role of the Defense Department in the U.S., where absent the Defense Department, you might say that, that a relatively very, uh, perhaps the most egalitarian distribution of income we've ever seen in the United States was a causal factor that drove innovation because the quality of opportunity was there, anybody could start. That clearly needs a great deal of um, modification in light of the very conscious and deliberate role of the American government. Um, turning to, finally, uh, to Andy Wyckoff and, and this remarkable uh, elaboration of the transformation of capital 
from the material into the virtual, the knowledge-based capital. I think it's a wonderful formulation and is, and is very rich. And I particularly note the, the, the point in which Andy said about that which had been compensated to labor, the, um, uh, the, the knowledge of uh, the, the, the uh, implicit understanding of how to get things done becomes capitalized into the firm's balance sheet. And the first thing I'd point out is um, there's a similar transition that took place uh, well more than 100 years ago and well documented by two great uh, economic historians, Naomi Lamoureux, now at Yale, and the late Ken Sokoloff. At the end of the 19th century, what was, had been called the, the golden age of the inventor. The, the, uh, in the United States, a, a market in, of, in patents uh, arose as individual inventors were able to get their ideas patented as remarkable intermediaries, patent attorneys, went out on the railroads, town to town to town, and did deals with individual inventors, got their patents uh, issued, got the patents licensed, and shared the revenues, shared the royalties back with the individuals. But by the late 19th century, with the rise of the science-based industries and the, the, the increasing mass, the requirement for physical capital to implement ideas from steel to electrification to chemicals and on to the automobile industry, uh, individual inventors could not, trans could not commercialize their ideas on their own, and they became employees. And it's only in the early 20th century that you begin to see that the patent, the name on the patent, goes from the individual inventor and is assigned to the employer. And so this is the first wave. But I think this, this is really worth study. Lamoureux and Sokolov have an exhaustive body of work on this. And I, I, would, I would urge it on you as a, a historical uh, resource and reservoir for informing what is, what is clearly um, going on today. Now, Andy began with Schumpeter Mark I, the first version, the heroic entrepreneur who uh, displaces the incumbents um, and generates creative destruction. That's 1913. 30 years later, um, as Schumpeter is sitting at Harvard, no longer aspiring to be the greatest uh, horseman, swordsman, economist, and lover in the world, um, he writes, he creates Schumpeter Mark II, the giant corporation, the perfectly bureaucratized giant firm, reduces innovation to a bureaucratic routine and, quote, ousts the entrepreneur. Now, I think that this uh, contrast between Mark I and Mark II which is seen in, if you read Schumpeter, it's sort of a time series. This was the inevitable consequence uh, through historical time. Actually, should be looked at in the cross section. And we should identify those industries which lend themselves to entrepreneurial startups, like the web enabled disruptive services sector. And those industries, virtually all of the output of material science, which require large enterprises with the resources to learn how to produce the new stuff cheaply and reliably, whether it's engineered polymers or whether it's graphene, uh, and then also have the resources, the time and the money, to find out what the new stuff is actually good for. The $5 billion order of magnitude that American venture capitalists pissed away on nanotechnology 10 years ago is evidence that startups are no good at doing science and commercializing novel materials. We need large enterprises with those resources. Uh, but in fact, what we're seeing today um, is emerge as a kind of Schumpeter Mark III, distributed research and development for large firms funded by venture capitalists uh, whose startups are born to be acquired if they can actually succeed in demonstrating that if you plug it in, it lights up, and there actually are a few people who will pay money for it, but who know that the challenge of scaling up is so great that the uh, opportunity to sell early, to sell, quote, too soon, 
uh, makes a great deal of sense. That model, I, which, which kind of begins in the pharmaceutical industry, is becoming much more general, despite the uh, apparent dominance of innovation in America by these uh, 80-odd unicorns, the uh, multi-billion dollar valued private companies that are in this, uh, and this is where I'll close, in this distinctive uh, segment, emergent segment of the economy, this, this where the internet and the associated technologies are now in a phase which offers very distinctive, and we don't know for how long, very distinctive opportunities. The way I put it is that IT today, like electricity in the 1920s, from the point of view of the user, is beginning to disappear. Uber requires that both sides of a two-sided market be absolutely protected from worrying about what's going on between them as they each push a button and generate a physical transaction. And the, the manner in which the emergence of the mobile cloud architecture for computing is enabling two-sided platforms where each side, both supply side and demand side, share the benefits of massive economies of scale and network effects, uh, is producing new sets of businesses which, on the one hand, are the ones that we see are the survivors of a vast array of startups. And I would be interested as to where that data on new startups comes from, because if you narrow down to the IT sector, I don't think you'd see the decline in number of startups that we see across the economy as a whole. Those startups presumably include restaurants, dry cleaners, et cetera. Um, so I'd like to see that data you know, more granular. Um, because with the radical decline in the cost of launching a startup thanks to open source software, cloud computing services, we're seeing an enormous number of candidates to benefit from these unique attributes of the web economy. Um, uh, but t a tiny number of them survive. The money being thrown at them by public market investors paying premium valuations without liquidity or governance rights, don't worry, that'll end in tears. The people making those investments will lose their jobs. A small number of these new companies will emerge as disruptive providers of services and will be vulnerable, as Schumpeter Mark I actually suggested, because the cost of uh, innovation uh, at, in this sub-segment of the economy has declined radically. And with that, I think I should conclude my response. Thank you all. Uh, very helpful. Um, as we move to the discussion section, could I have a sense, uh, just with a show of hands, of how many people wish to intervene, and then we can plan and plot? OK. M my suggestion is we take uh, questions in two groups. And, and give the panel a chance to respond, and, and then we'll wind up and we'll st start with you. And if you don't mind identifying yourself and a brief comment, please. Right, you can hear me. In his prolegomena to the conference, which appeared in Le Monde, um, Joe Stiglitz mentioned a number of ways in which the predicament of people who are doing badly in our contemporary economy can be improved. He mentioned improving the legal uh, institutional framework, unions, minimum wage. He mentioned uh, upgrading the education and skills of the people at the non-academic level. I would add a third thing, which I don't think the panel dealt with adequately, and that is the extraordinary way in which information technology systems in the workplace have engineered a gigantic leap forward in the practice of scientific management. Now, Wichkoff mentioned these KBCs and the vast amounts of information they yield. In her great book, 
nearly 30 years ago, Shoshana Zuboff raised the question, how will the information be used? Will it be used to employ, to empower employees, or will it be used to reimpose a system of scientific management? And I would argue on the basis of my research, 15 years work, that it's the latter. That what scientific management enables you to do in the digital age is to embody the expertise of scientific managers into codified sets of rules which are then iconic for employees because they are embodied in systems. And you find that in healthcare, human resource management, financial services, or higher education. Let me just mention higher education. The University of Oxford, where I've been for eight years, is being slowly ruined, in my view, by a system of scientific management which is very IT intensive, managed by an absolutely diabolical institution called Hefke, which imposes a very rigorous system of academic production on a great university, and it's gradually destroying it. So my question to Mr. Wyckoff, and through him to Brynjolfsson, who I'm particularly critical of, and see my forthcoming review of him in the New York, New York Review of Books, the question is not the vast quantities of information yielded by these systems, but the question of whose information is it? Who yields it? Who uses it? Inequality grows because, in my view, scientific management systematically de-skills and disempowers the majority of employees. Sir Giordani, Andy Wyckoff uh, made uh, a brilliant uh, presentation and the focus uh, particularly on uh, 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 knowledge-based capital and productivity work. So I would like to ask him where he puts the, the business of litigation around innovation and patents uh, into that uh, equation. Because uh, William Baumol, for instance, uh, has uh, identified the U.S. economy as a rent-seeking economy because uh, of the overwhelming weight that uh, the uh, litigation is uh, playing. On the other hand, uh, um, Steve Cohen has uh, focused uh, the, um, the role that lawyers uh, play in Silicon Valley. As, uh, to some extent, uh, he argues that uh, more than venture capitalists, at the end of the day, when you have to strike a deal, uh, you go to the lawyer. And lawyers uh, have become more important than uh, venture capitalists. So it, I don't know if uh, you have uh, reflected on that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Christian Reimsbach. I work here at the OECD on the topic called data-driven innovation. But my question is in, on innovation um, more in general, sorry. <clears throat> and in particular, I would like to, to, to refer to, to the work of um, Christensen's on um, the innovation dilemma, because a lot of the um, intervention made by the panelists reminded me of some of the issues that he pointed out. And for, for as some may not know the innovation dilemma, it's basically saying that um, that the most advanced or most innovative firms or incumbents have, uh, there is a risk that those firms cannot innovate because they are basically um, more concerned about the pursuit of short-term profits. And um, referring to the idea that um, those incumbent firms, as um, Jim described, pro probably have the power to exclude competitors, I wonder first to what extent um, there is a short-termism or the pursuit of short-term profit is a general um, challenge for our innovation capacity. And my, the second question is, um, what can we do basically to overcome the, the, the problem that in young, young firms cannot compete against the incumbents, in particular if they can, if they can use the IP regimes and IP systems um, to exclude competitors? Uh, one solution would be, should we kind of think about the potential new roles of governments, um, as um, William re reminded us what happened in Silicon Valley. And I would assume that this similar phenomenon is also happening in, in Israel, where um, I guess 
Um, there is also a strong connection between the IT startup industry um, and, and the defense um, department in Israel. Uh, good morning. My name is uh, El Storela. I work with Open Society Foundation's Public Health pro Program. And I have a question for you all, but maybe sp more specifically for Mr. Genoway and Balsili. You both highlighted fundamental uh, problems with the current intellectual property system, and there are many more that can be named, uh, for instance, in the pharmaceutical uh, sector, uh, which is where I come from. Um, where we don't actually have the innovation we need, but we only have innovation that can be patented and marketed. Uh, for instance, we know now that 75% of the new medicines that actually get to the market do not provide any therapeutic advance. They are patentable, the medicines, and they can be marketed with a lot of market inv marketing investments, but they provide no added value from a medical point of view. While we don't have the medical innovation we need, think about Ebola, think about the need for new antibiotics, etc. So the, the inno medical innovation system is completely deficient and misdirected. The few real innovations we have are unaffordable. Think about the new generation of hepatitis C drugs that are being sold at 80 to 90 thousand dollars per treatment to new cancer medicines, etc. So. Um, what, what I wanted to, to get at is, or hear from you, do you have a sense that the IP system, this monopolistic-based innovation incentive, can it be fixed? Or should we actually go back to a much more, uh, kind of get rid of the whole patent system and find different ways of innovation? The open innovation that you were citing, I mean, open medical innovation is something that in the public sector we're trying to, to promote, but it is really blocked by the very dominant uh, IP system today. So can it be fixed uh, and can we get more inclusive growth and innovation or should we just get rid of it and, and replace it, not only in the pharmaceutical sector, but more generally? So let's stop there. I know. Oh, that's because I was the last. There should be some advantage to WI, I guess. Um, I think because of the brevity of time, I wasn't able to unfold all of the slides. I didn't catch your last name, Simon, but I don't, th I think there's less disagreement between us than I sense. In particular, um, one of the things I suggest that we think about in terms of policy, uh, well, I think data is an incredibly important knowledge-based asset that many people haven't looked at. Luckily, Christian Ramsbach here is coming out with a large volume in June that I think is the best thing I've read on, uh, I hate the term big data, uh, but data-driven innovation. And it looks at it from a multi-dimensional point of view. One of the areas he looks at, and it was reflected in the slides, is going to the issue of competition, but also uh, kind of ownership of the data. And I think it's a legitimate question to raise about who owns the data and how we begin to, if markets can be created for this data and uh, with whom it should reside. What I threw up on the slide here, we do work on telecoms in this part of the OECD as well, and many telecom regulations have a specification of unbundling, where the incumbent owner of the network must grant access to others who want to enter into the market by uh, unbundling and charging themselves basically the uh, retail rate for that access as they would to the new entrance. There's a question whether or not this idea can be extended to data as well, as those people who are in collectors of it are required to share, and in some cases, a public right away, meaning the public would want that data for other uses, uh, cell phone data, the pings are being increasingly used to optimize bus traffic and, and so forth. But uh, maybe we can follow up. Um, I don't want to take up too much time. My good friend and colleague, Sergio uh, Arzini, um, I think this goes to, which I wasn't able to unpack as well, uh, what is the capital being used for now? Um, some of it's being used for investment. A colleague of ours, Adrian, says if you didn't have buybacks, investment would be twice as high. So we're seeing capital used for investment, for buybacks, for lobbying, as the line goes up, and probably for lawyers. I think Mr. Balsilli would be better placed. He talked about the large staff that 
RIM used to have that was a, a legal staff. Um, I think this is probably a smart investment for the shareholders. It's not clear this is the best use of the money for the, the broader economy. Um, let me end that. Sure. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, and and I'll, I'll just respond to those directed elements on um, uh, short-term profits for innovation versus you know, and how that's unplaying and then this idea of the system, can it be fixed and, and so on or throw it out. I, I, I mean, throwing out the IP system is a bit like a, a John Lennon song, you know, imagine a world with no borders, it's easy if you try. I think this is a system we have and it's a world we have and and so I think, I think um, we should work within the system that we have but start to surface the discussion, surface the awareness because I do not think people realize how one little change here massively percolates through the system incredibly powerfully. Um, and, and so I think it needs a very sophisticated uh, unpacking. Um, and when you talk about um, the kind of stuff that, um, you know, Clay Christensen, Innovator's d Dilemma, and, and, and stuff like that, I, I think the VC industry is, is quite sophisticated on finding, on identifying profit pools and deciding to attack it. So though you may have corporate short-termism, I don't think you have strategic investment capital that is as short-term. And, and, and so I, I'm not worried about the short-termism. What I pay more attention to is the fact that corporate incumbents have become very sophisticated at competitive decision-making, competitive gaming, competitive lobbying, and structuring a system that, that maintains their place and makes it progressively harder for new entrants to, to really um, strengthen, uh, create their jobs. And, and when you talk about these, this new startup strategy where you can do the early exit, in a sense, it, it's, a, it's, it's a great strategy for a young person, but it, it just keeps shifting that power stronger and stronger and stronger to those companies. It's a good gig if you can be on the winning side, but when you look at the equity structures, um, I, I, I don't think it uh, takes you where you, you want to go. But of course, if you win, it's great. Uh, so so, so I, I think the, the important thing in, in response to this is, is pay attention very closely to these subtle little elements they do in the system that enormously cascade all the way down and, and start to pay attention to how do we make small changes in the system that can massively um, uh, shift direction and, and it gets quite technical and I won't go into the technical elements but we could have fascinating discussions on little carve outs in uh, new patent laws and new copyright laws that fundamentally change really everybody's working and living environment for decades to come. It, it, it's almost the thing I look about, it's like corn subsidies in Iowa changes the food that your kids get at lunch and, and nobody sees the five steps but it's all baked in for the rest of time. And, and so I think that's the point, is you, you find that little fulcrum and that little leverage point, and, and, and that's where these kinds of forums are helpful. Yeah. So uh, on, on, on uh, following that theme, I think that a lot of what I heard from all the panelists is basically um, but people uh, surprise, surprise, actually react to incentives, and especially if you can measure for incentives. And we have been really bad as a society from academia, especially the British system, I have to agree, but not only. And it's supplying set of metrics that then we ask people or businesses to adhere to. And then we are really shocked that they do that because we don't think about unintended consequences. Uh, it's even more shocking, I agree, in academia, because if you actually think about how this all started is by somebody, but nobody asked them. I think it was even started in China, just doing, you know, listing of how good are universities and basically inventing stuff, how to measure universities. And then suddenly everybody is now performing according to those metrics. Uh, I would also agree with Jim that a lot of those things change on very little things that people don't see. 
um, if you look at the way American corporations actually work, and you talked about the stock buyback, it's actually very small changes in the laws. It's actually not laws, by the way, on the stock buyback. It's just a decision of SEC. Um, but it's also decisions of how you run the corporation and for whom and how do you judge it. So if you say, I want return on assets and you don't count capital assets, then everything that you can do in order to outsource capital assets to someone else while keeping knowledge assets, it's a great thing. <coughs> However, if you will now count capital assets, and it will actually show and return on assets and your real investment, it might change again. Um, and uh, sadly, <laughs> we all sort of expect those rules and accept them uh, instead of asking what they are, why we should have them, and how we can change them. Uh, and that may be a debate the OECD should start to lead. Um. Let me begin by entirely agreeing with Simon Head with respect to the research, the REF, the Research Evaluation Framework imposed on British universities, which, like all exercises in cost-benefit analysis, when applied to original research, original thinking, serves as a kind of equivalent of, of um, journalistic prior restraint. It's always easier to estimate the, the cost and the benefits. Retrospectively, looking back, may make sense, but in fact, the British REF uh, only looks at five years of publications, <laughs> and uh, it's noteworthy that the uh, National Science Foundation's investment, uh, in part uh, funded and supported by the National Security Administration in number theory, uh, went on for about 50 years before it produced the page rank algorithm, the commercial return on which is measured by Google's market value. Um, having said that, I would also note that innovation, and this is innovation, non-patented innovation in the healthcare sector, can be uh, empowering. And I'm speaking particularly of the checklist. The checklist, which uh, much uh, promulgated by the extraordinary writer and surgeon, Dr. Atul Gawande, and written up by him, which is now increasingly deployed in operating theaters in American hospitals where the nurses, the most junior nurse, is empowered to call out the most senior surgeon for not following a protocol which has been determined by exhaustive analysis of what goes wrong in operating rooms. So that in this case, quote, scientific management is actually empowering of employees with clearly quanti quantifiably validated better outcomes for patients. So it does go both ways. It does go both ways. Uh, second, Clayton Christensen, Innovator's Dilemma. First point, remember, Christensen in his original article isn't talking about short-term profits at all. He's talking about corporations listening mistakenly to their customers. It's like Henry Ford saying, if I'd, asked my cousin, if, I, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they'd have said they wanted a faster horse. Or Steve Jobs saying, why in the world would I ask any customer what I should invent? Um, having said that, the paralyzing effect of enormously high profits from uh, uh, incumbent uh, proprietary products, I celebrate. It was IBM's inability to get beyond the incredible profitability of its proprietary mainframe and mid-range computers that opened the door to all of us in the 1990s who delivered the distributed computing technologies which wound up completely blindsiding and displacing IBM as the, in, as the dominant force in commercial computing. And that leads me to say that when companies go ex innovation the way IBM did, I would much rather have them give their money back to their stockholders than continue to piss it away on uh, uh, ineffective programs of uh, attempting to, to milk customers that they think they have locked in. I'd love to see Oracle give it back its profits rather than simply uh, continue to lock its customers in 
to, um, to the systems it has. So I, I, I respect Bill Lozanek's work enormously, but he and I have been disagreeing about this for years. Um, and uh, I guess I would only finally add that with respect to this Schumpeter Mark III, it is the absorptive capacity of big companies that becomes critical. It's easy for big pharma to absorb a molecule and get it through clinical trials. It's really hard for technology companies to absorb people with vision and strategic understanding of emerging markets as well as who can, uh, who can actually write code and, and deliver it. Um, so I think that, that becomes a, a barrier to this success of the Schumpeter Mark III model. So with your indulgence, I'm suggesting we go no more than five minutes and, and go around and then keep your comments brief. You have your hand up. Oh, yeah. um. uh, Rob Duggar, I'm a uh, INET governing board member. Um, uh, Dan, you focused on the need to actually understand how innovation improves the lives of individuals. And I wanted to suggest that uh, in order to know that, we, we really need data. And there might be some in East Africa. I, I had the privilege of chairing a board of a company there for about eight years and I, in the last decade, and I, I literally watched telecom innovation spread very rapidly, but very unevenly. And that is, some villages got it, and some villages who were quite identical did not. So we might actually have data, since the, the uh, Tanzanian government gathers a lot of data on health and education and other well-being data, mainly at the, at the insistence of World Bank and IMF, but they, they may have the information which would enable you to compare the well-being effects of the availability of technology in locations that are actually socioeconomically similar, and then you'd be able to actually say something concrete about the effect of technology on well-being. Can we talk afterwards? Thanks for the presentation. Uh, I'm just starting with a favorite quote of actually my former professor, Mr. Uh, professor Janeway. The large-scale mobilization of capital, in, which is crucial in uh, any innovation policy. My name is Panayotis Barkas, by the way. I work for the OECD Southeast Europe. Uh, division of GRS. Uh, I just wanted to start by saying that uh, this quote, the large-scale mobilization of capital, crucial factor for innovation. What do we do if we have countries like the Southeast Europe, or whatever, or any developing countries in uh, the world, we want to promote, I mean, the innovation team, and we're trying to promote these innovation policies that uh, Dan Brisnitz uh, mentioned as well. Uh, for, uh, for other countries, but we, I'll try to, you know, uh, make the question in the frame of developing countries only now. If we don't have venture capitalists who are really willing to invest there, and uh, what would be your suggestion as a starting point for a policymaker who really wants to start creating, not deploying existing innovation, because it's uh, innovation at the moment is still platonic there, is a recombination of familiar elements and structures, but if we want to start with a point in this, what would be your suggestion for developing countries and their implication, the distributional ones leading to the presentation of uh, Mr. Wiskoff for the, which is already high, by the way, in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I, I fully agree with the remarks on that we should really put the question marks on recriticizing the buybacks. I think um, uh, buybacks are very important uh, for recycling money for the financing of future innovation. And the more money we buy back from successful uh, and it's been uh, sent out uh, to the shareholders, the more there is a likelihood that there's a possibility for early stage or seed or even pre-seed uh, financing and the most 60-70% uh, of all pre-seed financing 
of technology startups in the U.S. is still owned with angels or the informal venture capital market. And these are people who may have been shareholder before in such a company. So it's much better than to leave the money with the, with the management who doesn't have an idea how to spend the money. And the worst is, and that is another point where I agree with Jim, is if you look at IBM, is the profitability, a huge profitability of a company seems to be a precondition for failure uh, in the future. And, uh, and, and therefore, because they, they think if we make so much money with what we're doing now, uh, why should we uh, experiment and move into other fields? So there is no incentive really for doing this. And that leads me to the second point on the declining uh, number of entrepreneurship and the numbers. I have the same question again, Bill, we <laughs> seem to agree again. Uh, where are the numbers from? Uh, maybe the reason is uh, OECD is uh, heavily focused also on Europe. And for Europe, I, I would fully agree with this. We have a declining number of startups in Europe, even in Germany. Uh, we probably celebrate this year the 20th anniversary of a constant decline of startup firms in a country like Germany or in Western Europe is more or less um, uh, the same. And I would like to see a comment on, we're talking about inequality, uh, innovation inequality, but maybe there, there is much more inequality ama amazing in, uh, if you look on different regions in the world uh, where they have not the chance to uh, participate in this innovation process because of the decline of entrepreneurship and the even the worst thing, and that's the financing of, um, uh, of entrepreneurship. Um, uh, and I agree that in some parts of the world we have rather a rising number of startups, uh, and at least in the U.S. Uh, we see that the number for angel investing and venture capital is going up tremendously last year, <laughs> continuously now for four years. Um, it's about 28 billion in the U.S. and 29 or 30 is venture capital. If you put this all together, this is uh, uh, something like uh, uh, 300 or uh, uh, 200 or 220 U.S. dollar per capita of the population. Israel is even higher than that. If you look at Europe, the comparable number is between 10 and 15 U.S. dollars. So it's a one twentieth of uh, what we see in uh, in the U.S. And China is already on three of three to four. Uh, per capita, so much higher than already the um, EU. Therefore, I would love to have a, con um, um, a comment on, on, on that, and maybe we need to do much more work on uh, whether there is a declining in, in some regions, and why is it, and what could policy, there, there is a role for politics there to put framework conditions in place for increasing entrepreneurship, because that is basically the key for challenging the incumbents uh, in, uh, in that. Want to do this? Uh, no, I'll, 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 I'll be fast because really on, on the data question coming from both Peter and from uh, Bill, and I will be happy to uh, provide you with our volumes and our papers on, on, on this quickly. It's very good data. It is business enterprise data back to the U.S. Census, and we've done this through 22 different countries. And so it's not I've worked with Dun & Bradstreet data, some other micro databases. This is very robust data. The problem is when you do this internationally, you have a bit of a time lag. And so what you may be seeing right now in 2014, 2015, we're not picking up. I was just looking, what do we end, 2011? Uh, yeah. Uh, there was a recession. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. <laughs> Jeez, you know. <laughs> um, but, um, but we will continue to look at it, but, but what's interesting I just want to puncture the myth about the United States being the Hulk with entrepreneurship. You aren't that much better than Northern Europe and other places in the globe in terms of new entrants by this data. Okay? And I think it's important to reflect on this a bit. Now, it may be dry cleaners and restaurants and a few other things. And the next phase of this work, which is, a, I think, very important work, will begin to identify by sector and begin to move towards productivity. So that's a coming attraction for okay. work to come. Wow. We, we, we might actually disagree here. Um, <laughs> and, and, it had happened and, sometimes. And, and, and that is because we agree on just about everything. The, um, I, I think, and this goes to uh, your question on um, Southeast Europe and so on, um, 
the conference is Institute for New Economic Thinking, and uh, or the the organization, and uh, a lot of that came from efficient markets hypothesis flaws and 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 so on, which I think is very very useful. Well, I would like to put something forward for new economic thinking on your your question, is there's an orthodoxy of of fair competition, open borders, it's just a question of venture capital and good education. I would argue that the institutional structure is it's not a fair fight. And Southeast Europe doesn't have a snowball's chance in hell of creating an, an uh, innovation economy given the current rules. So quit wasting your time and money if you're not going to change the, the rule system. And, and, and I can show you um, Thomson Reuters data that says the IRR from, of, uh, uh, on venture capital to um, early stage companies in the United States uh, since inception is greater than 20%, which, which is a pretty good return. And in most countries, it's negative. So therefore, the reason you don't get venture capital, the reason you don't get startups is because you don't make money. And the reason you get in the US is you do make money. Now, Northern Europe is actually a high performance part of the world, and so they get an asterisk. That's very important because they're not representative holistically because of a lot of different things which are equally noble. So, so I think there's a, there is an opportunity here to um, have new economic thinking here. And the best thing to do is, 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 is say it's not a fair fight because everybody says it's a fair fight. Therefore, just get some fire in the belly and be smart like us. But in fact, I don't believe it's a fair fight, given what I've seen around the globe. And if you want to make it worth your while, you have to first address this root issue. Yeah. So um, I'll focus mostly on what you said. Um, and I'll say that there's another orthodoxy, uh, and that is that you actually need venture capital. So I did a lot of research on Israel and Ireland, and venture capital was the last thing that they did. They first fixed their institutional system. Then they created a huge amount of startups. Then they created a huge amount of startups which you can make money on. And then after all of that, and actually in the case of Israel, actually about 20 successful IPO on NASDAQ, they said, oh, uh, there's a bottleneck in the last stage, which is a scale up not seed, let's fix that one. And they did the Yuzma. Yeah. And the Yuzma, the nice thing about that is that apart from being very lucky because it was just the beginning, it's also had more than 4,000 companies with already revenues in the US, which just needed four or five millions in order to prepare themselves for IPO or merger and acquisition. So within five years, you get unbelievable return on investment. And because of that return on investment, you then have the next stage. However, and that's another thing to remember about Southern Europe, it also means that you have a system in Israel which is completely tied to American financial markets, right. where the system of innovation tells you, and, and if you want to be really cynical, what Israel has now is not a ICT industry, it has an industry of selling companies. <laughs> Mark three. <III>. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, so um, I want to make uh, two points. First, Rob, um, I think what you say about East Asia, uh, East Africa, is fascinating because I've just been exposed to what's been going on, courtesy of a friend, an extraordinary entrepreneur, a British uh, entrepreneur named Duncan Goldie Scott, who's created a whole network of mobile-based. Uh, payments companies, information businesses across East Africa. And for anybody who's looking for data, I have to believe Duncan has the data. Um, I'll be happy to introduce people to him. Um, the, the, the second, Jim, U.S. venture capital, don't get carried away. Over the, I've really done this, this work, and I know the literature inside out. Over the last 35 years, all of the excess return above investing in the NASDAQ index has been generated by a tiny number of venture capital firms. The skew in the returns is absolutely 
enormous. The vast majority of American venture capital firms look like Europe. And particularly, particularly... I said early stage yeah, venture no, capital firms. Approximately 20 U.S. firms account for all the excess return. Uh, there's a great set of papers that are coming out on the Burgess data, which is, is exhaustive, and it shows that for the U.S. venture industry, since 2000, the public market equivalent, that is the actual cash on cash return, uh, whether measured as IRR or as cash on cash, from investing in U.S. venture capital firms as investing in the NASDAQ index is also negative you would have done better investing in the index than investing in U.S. venture capital. So it's tough out there, guys. Don't aspire to be a venture capitalist. <laughs> and I, I realize the party's just getting going, but like a good central banker, I'll take the punch bowl away. Thank you all for your uh, inputs and for the panel. And, and something tells me we'll be back. <laughs>